Welcome to the Autism in Black podcast, where we focus on all things autism and the Black parent experience. Our goal is to always educate, support, and empower parents to advocate for not only their children, but themselves. Hello, and welcome to the Autism in Black podcast. I'm Maria Davis-Pierre, a licensed mental health counselor in the state of Florida and America's number one autism advocate for Black parents. I am the founder and CEO of Autism in Black, Inc., where we aim to include the excluded. Today, we have Shate Thompson, who is a licensed mental health counselor in Florida and Georgia. Ms. Thompson is the owner of Inspiring Hope Counseling Services, a private practice which focuses on helping all families strengthen their family unit, specializing in working with families of divorce to heal and transition smoothly. IHCS also specializes in women's issues, transitions, parenting support, helping individuals and families work through anxiety, depression, and general mental health. I'm excited about having Ms. Thompson on the show, and I hope you enjoy today's episode. Hi, and welcome to another episode of the Autism in Black podcast. I'm very excited about today's guest and today's topic. So today we have Shate, who is going to talk to us about co-parenting. Thank Thank you for being on the show. Oh, so happy to be here. Thank you for having me. Problem. So I have read your bio, which is amazing with all the things that you do, but can you tell us more about yourself? Well, definitely. I am, I am a divorcee, mother of two, a preteen and, and a teenager, and I am a licensed mental health counselor. As a licensed mental health counselor, I have a private practice, Inspiring Hope Counseling Services, where I help families of separation and divorce to heal, learn how to co-parent effectively, learn how to be, get reunited with their children if there was a major type of separation. And then I am also a Florida Supreme Court certified family mediator and qualified parenting coordinator, which I I work with the the courts to help families, making sure that children's best interests are happening in, in each home. Wow, that is amazing, which makes you an expert to talk about co-parenting, you know, because it Mm -hmm. it is something that I know my listeners have asked for this topic because, as we know, with having a child with a disability, the chances of a divorce happening is higher. And there's a lot, you know, surrounding co-parenting, like, you know, positive co-parenting, making it work, conscious Mm -hmm. co-parenting, you -hmm. know, but they don't quite know how to navigate that relationship. So let's talk co-parenting. You know, what suggestions do you have to those navigating a co-parenting relationship? All right, for sure. Well, I mean, for children to thrive and be resilient in a co-parenting household, it's really important that a few things take place, right? First, there has to be consistency. And when I say consistency, I mean in the schedules where children are aware and parents are following some type of set schedule for the children. Mm -hmm. This reduces anxiety for children to really know where they're going to be and when they're going to be in, in each place. Having structured activities that children can continue to do even though families have separated or become divorced. Mm -hmm. Having healthy communication, meaning it's non-conflictual, right? Because children can feel that tension when their parents are constantly arguing, bickering, not getting along, communicating in unhealthy ways. So making sure that communication is calm, cool, collected, reserved, and doing so where it's more professional, so the emotion is out of it, Mm -hmm. right? So that's super important. And then not sending messages. It's so important that parents are not sending messages with their children Mm -hmm. to the other parents, because this puts each child in a really difficult spot, because children want to please each parent. So when you're sending messages, it's difficult for them. Mm -hmm. So it's important that that's not taking place. And then not bad talking the other parents in front of the children. 
So that's truly important. Having structure in each home, meaning the expectations are clear, rewards, consequences are upheld in your household. This is going to help children to thrive and be resilient. And then last, having supportive environments, meaning that each, each parent is supporting children having a healthy relationship with the other parent. Um, so when we're able to take emotions out of the equation and we're constantly keeping our children's best interests in mind first, mm -hmm. this is the way that we're going to be able to have the consistency, the healthy communication, the structure and supportive environments. Wow, you said a mouthful there. And I noticed you said, take the emotion out of it. And you mentioned it twice. And I can feel that that is extremely important. But how mm -hmm. do parents start that journey of taking the emotion out of it, especially if the divorce was not pleasant? Okay, I love that question. How do we take the emotion out of it? Well, we need to make sure that we're getting help for ourselves, mm. right? Because mm. if we have a counselor for ourselves, a therapist, if we have trusted individuals that we're able to vent to, then we're not constantly going back and forth with the other parents. If we take a moment and pause and we are not reactive when something happens, but we can respond with a clear mind. Those things are going to help us to, to not respond impulsively or emotionally. And these are ways that we're able to take emotion out of the equation when we are dealing with the other parents. I love that. So when the divorce proceedings are starting, would you say that is a good time to begin to set those boundaries and start that co-parenting relationship? Definitely. I mean, once you see that you, you are not going to be together anymore, well, I, I, I guess I'll say once you truly are separated, mm -hmm. right? Because many families are still living in the same home as they are going through this, the beginning stages of, of divorce. Mm -hmm. So when you are living in separate homes, that's when it's important to start to set some boundaries with how you communicate with each other, how often you communicate and making sure that things are truly clear for your children. So many times I'm finding that parents want to protect and shelter their, their kids, that they're not having clear conversation, age appropriate, mm -hmm. clear conversations with their children. So children in the very beginning, it's kind of, they get some type of anxiety and they're feeling like things are, are off, but not really knowing exactly what's going on. So it's really important to have those age appropriate conversations with your children when you see that you're no longer going to be together. And then yes, set those boundaries and start to have the expectations of what's happening in each home that you're able to uphold that in each household. Perfect. So I get a lot of questions surrounding when parents are not on the same page. For example, one parent is in denial about their child's autism diagnosis, mm -hmm. uh, or one parent is extremely structured, you know, takes the child to their therapy sessions for their interventions, has a set scale, schedule for their child, and many other things. And then when they go to that other parent's home, it's not the same at all. So when it comes back to the structured parent, then the child has to kind of get acclimated again to mm -hmm. the schedule and the structure. So what do you suggest for those clients who, when parents are not on the same page? Okay, well, I'll, I'll kind of suggest the same thing that I suggest to a parent that does not have a special needs child, mm -hmm. but then I'll go a little bit deeper with what needs to be done if things are, if it's not able to happen this way, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So when, when I have parents that are coming in and one household, they're super structured, everything is going the way that it needs to go for that child. But when the child goes to their other home, they come back and they might have tantrums or they might have attitude or they might just have a difficult time getting back into the swing of things of how the household is, is run. 
right? So what I like to tell those parents is the same way that we need a wusa moment when we get home, right? How many of us sit in our car for a few minutes yes. before we actually go into the, the home, right? Mm -hmm. Or we might go and take a long bath right before getting into our domestic responsibilities. Our children need the same thing. Right. So having some type of conversation with our children, if they're able to have these conversations with us, depending on their age of what they need when they first come home. If it's a 15 minute Musa break for them to get their mind back into the way the household is run. If it's watching their favorite show, like a 30 minute show, and then they're getting back into this the um, swing of things, whatever it is, coming together and coming up with a plan of what that child can do when they first get home, right? And after that, everything else is held accordingly. Rules, expectations, consequences, quality time, all that good stuff. But letting them have a moment to breathe a little bit, to exhale a little bit, to get back acclimated to the way that their home with this parent is run. So I say that that is the best thing to do with, with all children, right? But then if we see that this is not working, especially for our, our parents with children with autism, mediation might be the best bet, right? Where we actually have a mediator and we can set some things with the courts of what must be followed. Mm -hmm. So it's in the best interest of your child that they're getting what they need. If it is making sure that they're going to therapy sessions or having certain things in place in each home. So your child or your children are getting exactly what they need. Wow. You know, one, I didn't think about, you know, the transition from home to home and needing that time to kind of transition back to the place that they're at. So that is a great point. And then I did not know that you could get specific stuff in your mediation details in your actual court documents. So that's great. To yes. You can put it in there and say, you know, you have to take the child to their therapeutic sessions and things of that nature. Right. I mean, we're, it's always about what's best for your child, mm -hmm. right? So if this is truly best for your child, that they're able to get their interventions and their set their therapy sessions in and it's going to help them to thrive in each of their households this is something that can be put in the mediation documents and then it can be upheld in court perfect and then what has come up for you when working with your clients that a lot of people are unaware of when it comes to the co-parenting relationship? What do you believe people don't talk about enough or they're just completely unaware of? All right, that's a really good question. What are they unaware of when working, when working with families? And what's not spoken about much is sometimes the other parent just isn't willing, mm -hmm. right? And so many times we have one parent that truly wants to have a co-parenting relationship, but the other parent is not willing and it's non-existent. Mm -hmm. And what do we do with that? What can we do with that? And what I say is it's important that we always navigate with a positive mindset, right? So in front of your children, make sure that you are doing your part to be kind, caring, communicate effectively, speak kindly of the other parent, encourage your children to have positive relationships with the other parent and then find somewhere else to vent to, right? And when you do that, eventually your child is going to be able to see who is who and what is what, right? But it's on their own time that they're able to see that. But it's our responsibility to raise mentally and emotionally healthy children. And the way that we do that is by teaching them with kind words and having that consistency on what we actually have control of. Mm -hmm. I love that. And you brought up a, a great point about the parent being willing, because I know that another question that I, I get asked a lot is regarding blurred lines in the relationship. So, mm -hmm. you know, one parent does not want to continue any kind of relationship, but they feel that if they don't, it will impact how the other parent feels about their child. So they can't uphold good boundaries. You know, they, the lines are blurred. So what suggestions do you have for them? 
let me see if I truly understand your question. Are you asking if parent A does not want to have a relationship with parent B, mm-hmm. but they feel that it's important for the child that they have a relationship or at least some type of co-parenting relationship, but the lines get blurred with parent B? Are you saying that? Like parent B still wants to have a romantic relationship while parent A does not? Exactly. Ah, okay. So how do we, (laughs) how do we set some really good boundaries? I love that word. Boundaries is, well, boundaries point blank period is about making sure that they are clear and direct Mm -hmm. and that you yourself and you hold the other person accountable. Right. So to do that, let's say that you only communicate about the children or you only communicate through text message and emails and it's not over the the phone. Right. Or you're not accepting calls after a certain time. So you can set that tone, be clear and direct with the with parent B of what is what you are going to be okay with and what you are not okay with. Right. And then once that is done. You don't, you hold them accountable to not go over that, like not cross that, that line. Is is that clear? No. Yes. 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 Okay. So it's our responsibility as parent A to hold the other parent accountable to our boundaries once we set them, Mm -hmm. but we have to make sure that they are clear and direct. Perfect. I love that. So for those who are co-parenting in a blended home, mm-hmm. what suggestions do you have for them? Because I know that can get pretty sticky when we have a child who is autistic in the home and the parent is used to doing certain things. And then there's the step parent who mm-hmm. involved and then the child's other parent. That's other parent. A uh, yes. Okay. So I, lo- I love this. Yes. So in a blended home, first things first, All adults, both parents and the bonus parent, need to be on the same page, right? Mm -hmm. The bonus parent, it needs to be clear with what that bonus parent is. I hate to use the word allowed and not allowed, Mm -hmm. but it needs to be clear with what's okay, like what type of disciplining, what type of expectations, what's acceptable for that bonus parent to do or not to do, right? Mm -hmm. And then that bonus parent spouse, which, which is, let's just say parent B, right? It's them as a team to make sure that they are supporting each other in the household with their children, Mm -hmm. right? So communication is first key that parent A, parent B, and bonus parent are all on the same page, right? That they are clear with what's okay, what's not okay, how much, and just feeling secure that bonus parent has the best interest of the child at heart. And parent B is always supporting bonus parent no matter what. So that helps to to keep the fire down, right? Mm -hmm. And then second thing is it's important to build relationships. That makes a huge difference. So in the home, relationships need to be built with children and bonus parent and with children and parents in the home point blank period, right? So when relationships are built, when rapport is built, when time is spent, when quality time is spent together, then when disciplining has to happen or when speaking to has to take place or anything at all has to happen, it's well received because a relationship is built. I love that. And at what, because, you know, we're talking and we're making it seem like it's easy and we know it's not as therapists. We know no. that it's easy at all. At what not at point all. do you recommend they reach out to uh, someone like yourself who niche is working on the co-parenting relationship? I think from the very beginning, it's important, right? Mm-hmm. Once, once we see that we are going to have a blended family and we are starting to build relationships in the home. Anytime that we are communicating, building relationships, doing what's needed, and we are seeing that we're having bumps along the way or button heads 
along the way. We shouldn't let it escalate to where it's chaos and tension in the home. We need to nip it in the bud from the very beginning. So definitely contact a professional that's going to be able to assist. And that way you'll be able to get tools, strategies to start using from the very beginning to have a thriving, healthy home. Perfect. And if one, let's say if parent B is not willing to work on the co-parenting relationship, but parent A is really wanting um, tools to make it not as difficult with parent B, would parent A be able to just come and see you and work on getting those tips to have a better relationship with parent B, even though parent B is totally unwilling? Definitely. Yeah, for sure. Because the same way that it's because we've been in it, it's, it's hard to take our emotion out of it. It's hard to see it through different lens. When we go to a professional, they're able to help us to see things a bit differently and work through and process through some of our own thinking or how to approach it in a different way that can lighten the load. So yes, parent A can still get tools and strategies even if parent B is not willing. Perfect. And I know you've mentioned discipline a few times in talking, and I know that you talk about disciplining in the child's love language, which I've never heard before, but I'm (laughs) very interested to find more about. Can you tell us more about that? For sure. Um, Gary Chapman. Gary Chapman speaks about the five love languages, Mm -hmm. right? And he has a book, The Five Love Languages for Children. And when you read that book, you, you learn about that the same way as adults, when we are looking to have a romantic relationship, mm-hmm. we each have our love languages. And when we're able to understand our own love language and our spouse understand our, our love language, it helps the relationship overall. The same thing with our children. If we take note of the way that our children loves us and the way that our children love, let's say, their siblings and their peers, Mm -hmm. we are going to be able to take note. For example, my eldest, whenever she goes to the store, she will buy little knickknacks. I I love Kit Kat. So she'll just get me a Kit Kat, right? Or just little tiny trinkets. Whenever we holidays came around, she wants to buy the bus driver a gift. So one of her love languages is definitely gifts, right? Another one of her love languages is quality time. So it's important that we take note of what our children's love languages are. So on a regular basis, we are giving them, we're pouring into them with that love language. But now when it comes to disciplining, right, it's important that we take note of what their love language is. So it's not coming across as disciplining without love. For example, we cannot say if we know that our child's love language is quality time, right? And we're going to have them in time out for a certain amount of time or sitting in their room for a certain amount of time. If we are taking note of what their love language is, we will limit how much alone time we're having them have before we go and we sit down with them and talk to them and we can help them explain to us why they were on, on, on punishment or what took place. So we can still love on them, even if we dislike a behavior that, that was done. Wow. That, you know, at first I didn't know there was the love languages for children. So I'm going to have to go get that. <laughs> I have the one for, you know, us as adults and for our relationship. Yes. I did not know there was one for children. So I need to get that. But that makes perfect sense about disciplining with their love language in mind. Mm-hmm. You know, so if their love language is physical contact, how mm-hmm. would you discipline with that in mind? Okay, so if you're disciplining with that in mind, what you're going to do is like after you reprimand them for something, you can still give them a hug afterwards, Mm -hmm. right? You can still give them a hug and say, I love you. I dislike the behavior of what you did. And this is what we're going to do moving forward. So just because you dislike something that was done, it doesn't mean that now they, they have to stay off and you can't hug them or rub their back or, you know, like 
show them love in their love language still, even though we're able to reprimand them. Oh my gosh, you have dropped so many gems on this podcast <laughs> that is even helpful for, for me. And, you know, me and my husband are married, but I still think of what we do is co parenting in a sense with our children because we're of not course. On the same page. Yes, because we have different <laughs> parenting styles, right? So right. we need to make sure that we're keeping that in mind. So, yes. But yeah, it's been very helpful. I give me a lot of resources <laughs> and I'm going oh, to implement these things. <laughs> So what resources, advice, or tips for parents and caregivers do you have as we wrap up? Alrighty, well, the the two resources that I definitely wanted to share with your listeners was one, the book by Gary Chapman, Mm -hmm. um, The Five Love Languages for Children. And then the second is the Co-Parenting Handbook. Mm -hmm. This is by Karen Bonnell. So it's where we're able to raise well-adjusted and resilient kids from little ones to young adults through divorce and separation. Mm -hmm. So it's called the co-parenting handbook. Perfect. And we will have both of those resources in our show notes. Thank you. So where can listeners find you? Because I know they're going to be definitely knocking on your door now to get some of these uh, therapy sessions for these skills you amazing skills you have. <laughs> where can they find you all right well there's a couple of ways i actually have a membership that's starting um towards the end of the year so if they would like to gain more information on that they can go to my website inspire hope health healing inspire hope health healing and they can click on the membership icon and put in their information there so they'll be able to get first dibs because there is going to be an early bird special so that is the first way that they can get in contact with me other things is um you can find me on instagram which is at shate thompson i have a youtube channel if you just search my name shate thompson you'll be able to find that and I am on Facebook, which is Shate Thompson with the number two. Perfect. And we will have all of that in the show notes as well. Thank you so much, Shate, for coming on and schooling us on how to have great co-parenting relationships and about um, disciplining in your child's love language. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Thank you so much for having me. And thank you all for listening. And we will see you at the next episode of the Autism in Black podcast. If you haven't done so, make sure to subscribe to our podcast so you can always be notified when a new episode drops. To get the resources shared on today's podcast and the show notes, make sure to go to autisminblack.org slash podcast. And be sure to share your takeaways from the show on IG stories and Twitter using our official hashtag AIBpod so that we can find them and share them. And if you want to continue the conversation from today's episode, make sure to join our Autism in Black podcast Facebook community. And please make sure to answer the questions to gain entry. Thank you for listening and joining me this week. Have a good one.